All right, and we should be live. Did I actually hit done? Did I update that? Uh, I hope I did. <clears throat> Wait, are we on 17? Weren't we on 18 at this point? Uh, not only might I not have hit the button, I might have not actually updated it. Well, we'll figure it out later, I suppose. <clears throat> All right. So that little bit of bookkeeping out of the way. All right. So we are working on Gearson Starn still. Um, we are working on the Pings Matter version because I, you know, air quotes, finished the uh, Storm version. So we've been working on the Pings version. Still... Still not thrilled with the Storm version. Storm version came out super, super unexciting. Um, so I've gotten a a question about, um, you know, more, what's the word I'm looking for? More budget-friendly builds. And I did do a budget-friendly uh, suggestion thing for the Beamtown Bullies when I built them. Uh, especially for the less cutthroat version of it, the more political-minded version of it. Um, so, I thought I would do that with Gearson while we're working on the Ping's Matter version. And... <clears throat> so... Being somebody who has everything and who tends to get everything as it comes out, like, it's very rare that I don't get something from the new set by the time the next set is, like, halfway through its thing. You know, like, if I don't... Like, I haven't gotten, like, Jet Mirror yet still or uh, Battle Angels of Tear. But, you know, I have everything from Dominaria except for, like, one card now. I'm missing the, the snake... Uh, the green... The green Defiler. Uh, Defiler Vigor, I think he's called. The big snake worm creature. Um, and I'm still working on getting stuff from Infinity. like I haven't bought any boxes yet, I've been trying to get them slightly cheaper, because I'm not, like, Unfinity is really weird, because most of the cards I don't even need from it, in order to get what I need out of it, like, I need the cards that are actually tournament legal, not, like, the uncards, <clears throat> so... I get caught off guard a lot of the time when something that I grabbed early on becomes this insane pile of money later. So, when going through the prices on things, uh, I was not surprised at all by uh, Fierce Guardianship and Deflecting Swat. I knew those things were expensive because when I tried to go get more of them, I could not find them at reasonable prices. Uh, and they're just keep going up, so I kind of wish I had gotten some back then anyway, at like basically the price of the deck that they came in. Uh, now they're worth, you know, like 50% more than that. So that was kind of, but I knew that. Like I tried to get some more, so I knew they were going to be expensive. The one that threw me off that I, I guess I kind of knew. He was a thing, but I was still kind of surprised. Dockside Extortionist is apparently about $55 on eBay. Like, you know, if you go by the, like, can you get, like, more than, like, two or three of them at around this price, basically. Like, when I look for cards on eBay, I don't just go by, like, oh, the absolute cheapest one is, like, $3 or $10 or $30 or whatever. So that's what the price point is. It's like, no. Like, do you have, like, a bunch of them at that price point? Because if you have, like, one or two people selling beat-up copies for, like, $10, and then you have, like, 30 people selling, like, you know, mint copies for 25 then it's, like, a $25 card. Right? So, Dockside Extortionist is, like, $55. Like, I couldn't find enough of them at 50 to put them at $50. Like, he, I had to put them at, like, 55 in order, like, including shipping, too, because if you don't include the shipping price, then you're kind of, like, the cards are actually secretly, like, a couple dollars more than they look like they should be a lot of the time. So, it, if I can't find them, like, a whole bunch of them without 
like with free shipping or anything, then I have to include the shipping costs in there to factor in like how expensive the card actually is if you were to go out and buy one. So yeah, Dockside Extortionist, $55, and I kind of knew it was a card that people wanted copies of when I saw that they put him, like, he was one of the early spoilers for the last Double Master set, and some people were excited about that, and I was kind of like, okay, and they put him in at Mythic, so that that's also usually a pretty good indicator. So yeah, Dockside Extortionist, $55. I was kind of taken aback by that one. <clears throat> so anyway, so yeah, I went through, I priced out a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> And so that way I know if I'm trying to include a card that's, you know, like a bit too expensive, we can discuss more budget-friendly options for replacing it. Or there will be cards that I include that aren't 100% essential to the deck. Like, if I leave Ristic Study in, Ristic Study is... I've never found Ristic Study to be essential to the decks. Like, I almost never run it, even in the... yeah. Despite the fact that it um, interacts with players, it's kind of... First of all, it's kind of obnoxious. You always have to ask the other players if they're going to pay the one for heuristic study. And second of all, most players pay the one, like, unless they're going to do something really spectacular and backbreaking that turn. They usually pay the one rather than let you draw the card. And against the players that will let you keep drawing the card that's usually not... Like, either you don't need the extra help because you are going to crush these players horribly, or you desperately need the extra help because they have figured out what they are going to do, and, you know, you getting a couple extra cards is not going to stop them from winning most of the time. So, Rustic Study is kind of weird like that. I... It doesn't do what you want it to do. It's not, you don't just get to draw, like, 20 cards because people are constantly playing spells in Commander. You usually get to draw, like, a couple cards. And usually you need those cards because the person that's letting you draw cards isn't acting their combo right that second, and you need to find your counter spell right now. So, Ristic Study... This is it's kind of low on my uh, list, despite how expensive it is and how people just love to jam it in decks, which is, you know, why it's so expensive. I didn't bother putting prices down for, like, the, the very expensive mana base for the deck for the most part. Like, I kind of know where all the fetches are at and the dual lands, so the, those ones can be easily replaced by... Um, some combination of basics, non-basics that have the, that produce both colors of mana. They don't even necessarily, like, if you're not going to run the fetches, then you don't need to run the duels specifically that have the dual land type. You can just run, you know, like, the red-blue, like, swift water cliffs and whatnot. You can run those. There, there's no harm in running any of them uh, in your deck. Uh, there just comes into play tap lands that produce both colors of your that your deck is built around. So that's really not. I've said this like many times when discussing budget options. The mana base for my decks always looks horrifyingly expensive and unattainable. Um, but when you get down to it, most decks don't even kind of need <laughs> that level. If you're not going to be playing against the most competitive uh, commander players you can reasonably find, uh, then you probably don't need, um, you know, dual lands or even shock lands and, like, the higher-end mana base and all the fetches and everything. Like, those things are nice, but they're, like, not even a full multiplier better for how much they work for your deck. They're, they're like, percentage points. Uh, improvement to your deck for the most part, so 
Like, yes, obviously, Volcanic Island is way better than any other dual land you could possibly have, but having a Volcanic Island in your deck doesn't make your deck, you know, like, 5% better. It, it makes it, you know, like, probably, at most, like, at most, I would have to say, like, between 1% and 2% better. <laughs> um, <clears throat> like, you're not gonna, the only time you're ever going to wish you had a volcanic island is when you draw one of your comes into play tap dual lands on a crucial turn where you needed to have an untapped source of one of your colors of mana. And at that point, it hurts you more that you had a tap land instead of a basic a lot of the time in a dual color deck. So. So, yeah, you just don't get hit that hard for running. Um. You know, comes into play tap duels instead of the actual, like, super expensive dual lands that come into play untapped all the time. Um, yeah, you don't need any of those. I have them, so I include them when I'm building my mana base, but they're not even kind of close to essential. So, unless we left off, our count was at 182. All right. I started doing this, and then I had to stop for a while, so I was on, like, Snapcaster for the how much money is this deck, and then I went and finished the rest of it, like, later that night. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so if you see the prices going by, that's just where all of that came from. And the ones that don't have prices, like, they, they were basically, I think the most expensive ones were, like, 250 on average for the ones. Unless I just didn't check the price because I did not think it was going to be anything, like it's a common or something, and it turns out, you know, it, it's, like, Ristic Study type of thing. But even most of them, like, anything that I usually... Uh, look to to put into the deck. I did check uh, things like Shattering Pulse because I can't remember like if they were reprinted in Commander decks or whatnot, where they'd be cheaper. Um, you know that sort of thing. All right, so we had right 182, so 122. Wow, I am redlining and dropping frames. I give up. Apparently Monday is not a good day for my computer this week. What's wrong, computer? Why, why are you dropping so many frames? Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna, gonna scroll through a couple times, see if I can find any cards that jump out at me as things, and just kind of refresh my memory as to where we're at right now. <clears throat> Bombardment, Mog Fanatic, we want to try to keep Searing Touch, Whispers are fine. <clears throat> Heat of Battle. Creature blocks that steals one damage to that creature's controller. And the other one was... Hmm, I have to double check what the other ones were now, because that's Heat of Battle. It was close quarters. One of the other ones in Battle Strain was one of the other. Okay, so we'll keep going then. Curiosity, Shattering Pulse, Shivan Gorge, <clears throat> Memory Jar. Repercussions um, might be one of the most expensive cards that I'm going to wind up, like, almost definitely keeping uh, for this version of the deck. I think Repercussions does a lot for the deck. Um, which does mean it clocks in at like $20. So this and a handful of the cards from the Warhammer decks, although they should all be, like, except for the staff, which I believe the staff is from the Mono Black deck, um, and I don't 100% know that the staff has to stay, but all of the other expensive cards from the Warhammer decks, I believe, are all from the same one. They're all from the Red, Black, uh, Blue Commander deck. So, the one that Gearson himself is from. So, while they are all, um, like, if you add the three of them together that are the most expensive ones, they're almost as much as the deck itself costs anyway to buy them individually. So, at that point, if you're planning on building the Gearson Starn deck, you 
probably should just buy the deck that he comes in uh, while it's still floating around for, like, I want to say MSRP, but Wizards tries to not say an M- N- MSRP anymore, which is kind of obnoxious, except when they want to tell you that they're selling, you know, proxies for $1,000. Uh, then, then they'll tell you the price point for it. But, yeah... But when they do things where, when they ship things now, they don't have an MSRP, which is kind of obnoxious, because then you don't have an official, like, okay, this is what you should be expecting to pay for these things. And also because of that, when prices go up, or when things are in limited supply, you don't necessarily know why you're paying this much for any given item. And that's kind of annoying that we definitely want to try and keep and there's battle strain your blocks deals one so battle strain is creature blocks deals one damage to its controller close quarters is uh creature blocks i can deal one damage to any target and heat of battle is when a creature blocks this deals one damage to the creature's controller I don't know that we need all three of them. This one is Ren 1. Close Quarters is the strongest one, and that's 4 mana. And Battle Strain is also Ren 1. Like, if you put too many of these in play, then players just don't block. Um, because they're actually taking way too much damage from blocking. Uh, your one power attacking creatures. Also, we still have, uh, what's her name? The, uh, descendant of Umizawa who makes your guys, uh, unblockable if they have one power, one toughness. And since a lot of our creatures are going to be one power creatures anyway. Yeah, I don't think that the battle strain and whatnot, like... I kind of like having one or two of these effects in the deck, but I don't think we need all three of them. And the four mana one is definitely the best because you get to deal one damage to anything when an opponent... It's when an opponent's creature blocks too, right? Like, so it's not stopping us from blocking things. Because Gearson will shoot us if we decide... Yeah, when my creature becomes blocked... But then again, the other ones are whenever a creature blocks, so those work when the opponents are attacking each other, too. So they can still take three damage. Uh, so Battle Strain deals the damage from that one. The other one, uh, Heat of Battle, also is the source of the damage. It matters if the uh, blocking creature or my enchantment is the source of the damage, because if it's their... A uh, thing that becomes the source of the damage. Gearson doesn't um, kick in, I don't believe. Hang on. Right, it has to be whenever another source I control. Yeah, so it does have to be a source I control dealing the damage. But apparently these things are all the same. Like, Heat of Battle and Battle Strain just happen to be the same thing. And... I know uh, Battle Strain is an uncommon from, uh, was it Odyssey or Onslaught? Now, I do forget which one. Was. It's from Odyssey. Okay. So, although they are, like, in the same price range, so it doesn't matter which one I cut, I don't think. But I believe we can cut one of them, maybe both of them. We can definitely cut one. We don't need both, or all three, rather. I don't know if we need... Like I said, I like close quarters more because I get to decide where the damage goes. So, I can choose to, like, deal a damage to the blocking creature then and have Gearson shoot it and maybe my guy doesn't die in combat now. Uh, Or I can still deal the damage to the defending player or I can throw one damage to somebody else's face. You know, I get to deal damage to anybody at that point. doesn't have to be the one I'm attacking. So, if I'm attacking somebody who has to block, then and then hope I throw the damage elsewhere, then I get to actually throw the damage where I wanted it type of deal. Yeah. 
Yeah, we definitely don't need both of them, and I'm not sure if I want, like, one of them. <clears throat> Just for that. Because, like I said, they are, they do both trigger, and they are separate triggers. So, if you're, one opponent is attacking the other opponent with, like, some horrifying monstrosity that needs to get blocked, uh, they could wind up taking six damage just because they're blocking and that's kind of like it's bad for our things attacking because our things are going like our goal is to have our things be one power creatures so they won't be getting blocked a lot of the time because then i just get to throw a lightning bolt at your face anyway or they'll get blocked so that way they can kill the creature but you know if the difference is between taking a lightning bolt to the face and not killing our creature or taking two lightning bolts to the face and killing our one power creature, they're probably going to take the one lightning bolt, try and kill Gearson, and then kill our stuff. So. Would like to keep Jessica. I'm cutting, like, all of the other tap deal one damage, but I kind of like her with the whole haste and whatnot. And it's nice to get Kamal's sister involved in a game. Maybe we still cut her. She is... She does clock in at $4, which is a... Like, if we can cut out some of the other expensive cards... Unfortunately, that means for budget builds, we do have to lose Sharpshooter, who is a card that I have... I did not realize Sharpshooter was still this expensive. I figured he had gotten reprinted enough that his price would have gone down, but apparently everything he's gotten reprinted in is too expensive, and he hasn't gotten reprinted recently enough. So yeah, Sharpshooter is clocking at like $15. So Maybe maybe we cut Jessica, but we leave her off to the side as a more budget-friendly consideration for a card like Sharpshooter to replace it. Even though she's not doing anywhere near as much. Which is why there's the price differential. Uh, also, if we want to do the cloning Gearson without cloning Gearson, uh, Sakashima and the other Sakashima are both, like, surprisingly expensive. Like, this is the one from, uh, original Kamigawa block, and it's at $10, and the one from the, uh, Commander Legend says, like, 20 or 25 something like that. Uh, Flame Fusilade... Remand, Electrolyzed, Electrode, Playline of Lightning, Hypnosit, Pyromatics, Repeal. Grape Shot, Ophidian Eye, Think Twice, Coalition Relic, Needle Drop, Research. I do like having the Blight Sickle just because we have a bunch of things that can deal damage to targets. Is there any other equipment that gives Death Touch? Because I know we have the Collar, and there's like a Gorgon Head or something, I think, that you can equip a creature with. Um, yeah, let's do a Duplicate Tab. Yeah, no thanks to that. Uh, advanced Search... Uh, subtypes. Is equipment a subtype on this? Or is that just... Oh no, equipment is a subtype. Okay, so we add equipment, and rules text we add death touch. And we see what we get. Oh, there are two different Gorgon's heads. Um, so this one costs one extra mana, gives plus one, plus one, and death touch. And they both equip for two. Uh, Groom's Fire we don't care about. Uh, creature becomes blocked by one or more colorless creatures, gains death touch. Mirror Shield deflects death touch. Uh, the Quietus Spike. Hmm. Well, a spike is actually interesting, and then we have, like, three black equipments. And you have to uh, death touch if you have a rogue, which we don't have a ton of rogues in the deck, so multi-class Baldric is not helping. I wonder if we want the Quietus Spike. Quietus Spike? 
whatever it is. Like we have way we well, have ways. We have a way to make our creature unblockable. Um It's three to cast, three to equip, which is a bit expensive. Despite the half life loss trigger, like Vassalist Collar definitely, because I like giving out life link and I was kind of considering um like Loxodon Warhammer. Well, I'm thinking of it. What what do we have for equipment that gives life link? Yeah, I'm a bit sad that only the scythe gives wither. I wouldn't have minded another card. Vigilance, life link, and plus one, plus one. Life link if it's a human. Warhammer. The life link is from a cleric, which again, we don't have a ton of. Uh, resurrection orb, but that's four to equip. Oh, right, the shadow spear. Um. Yeah, I'm. I suppose it would be the Shadow Spear over the Luxodon Warhammer with the three to cast, three to equip. Like the one to cast, two to equip, because we don't care about the power and t or toughness boost. In fact, the power and toughness boost is actually detrimental to a bunch of our creatures. Yeah, if we wanted. And this thing costs five to equip. So. So yeah, I don't think we need either of, like, maybe that one. I'm just thinking uh, Lifelink and Death Touch because we have a bunch of other pingers and things that can deal a damage, so giving them the Death Touch and Lifelink also is relevant. Gearson, though, is our primary target for stuff like that. Death Touch, Lifelink, Wither, like, stacking all of those effects on top of him really lets him cut through a lot of creatures that we would otherwise have some kind of problem with. So, and gains us a ton of life. Like, the lifelink obviously isn't helping us kill creatures, but, you know, we deal one damage to each of our opponent's creatures, and there's a bunch of creatures out. Like, Gearson can gain us, like, 40 life, you know, just for having 20 creatures in play between, like, four players. <sighs> Now, granted that, I suppose that's unrealistic. We can probably gain, like, 10 to 20 life, probably, by dealing one damage to each of our opponent's creatures while he's in play. But that's still, you know, half a starting life player, or, or yeah, half a player starting life total from, like, you know, casting and the festivities. So... I'd uh, be very much okay with giving Gearson lifelink, but also giving him death touch so he can finish off creatures and giving him wither so he can get through indestructible creatures. Alright, so we'll consider those, uh, but for the time being we need to make more cuts to the deck. Because we still need like a hundred-ish cuts. Hmm. Which is going to be a little bit difficult. Not as much. Okay, yeah, there's the Blight Sickle, which is what made me think this. I mean, for budget considerations alone, I suppose we don't need Glenelendra Archmage. The nice thing about her is that she comes back as a 1-1 uh, flyer the first time, so she actually becomes kind of stronger with the way our deck works by coming back with a minus one, minus one counter. Like, and that type of thing really amuses me with this deck. It's like, we make it smaller, and that makes it deadlier. Like, the same is true for, like, that the pink horror or whatever, the one from the Warhammer decks, where it's like, the regular version deals two damage when you um, cast an instant or sorcery. But then if it dies, it splits into two one ones that deal one damage per instant or sorcery each. And... That makes, like, all the difference in the world. It goes from dealing two damage to the opponent for us casting a spell to dealing six damage to the opponent for casting a spell because they got smaller. 
and, and their damage got divided up. So, I really want to be able to, uh, really want to be able to, sorry, I got, like, my brain started wandering off there for a minute, wrong, wrong train of thought, like, I really like the idea that weakening the creatures for a lot of them actually somehow paradoxically makes them stronger in the deck. Like, being a one-power creature is so much stronger than being a two-power creature in this deck, it's actually kind of silly. And that amuses me. But yeah, we might be able to cut the Glenolendra. We could definitely cut her for budget reasons, like, she's not essential. We can replace her with, like, any other uh, counterspell effect uh, that's cheap enough. See Guanar, see Fireheart, Basilisk Collar, Magma. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the Magma can still go. Like it does let us sacrifice our other permanents, like our other non-land permanents as well. So being able to sacrifice like treasures or enchantments that we don't necessarily need anymore to deal one damage is okay. But I think honestly I kind of want to cut down and focus on either the Going back to the creatures that deal a damage when we cast instants or sorceries, but not trying to storm necessarily, like just letting it happen over the course of a couple turns. That one, or all of these tiny creatures attacking our opponents, which still kind of works with the uh, storm aspect of the deck, where we're just we're going to make all of these like one ones off of empty the warrens type of thing. So, I don't think we need the Magma. I do think I want to keep, like, the Raid Bombardment and the Cavalcade of Calamity, then. But we need to cut so many things. We can probably go ahead and cut the Metamorph. Metamorph is good, and it would be fine in this deck, but it's not necessary. And... It's one less expensive card I need to come up with a replacement for. Uh, Snapcaster is just a value card. Like, he's really good, but that's why he's $25. Like, he's not super essential to the deck. So, if you need to cut um, Tiago Chan here, he'd be fine doing so, I think. Goblin Slide... Outpost Siege, Impact Tremors. Actually kind of want to cut the Occam Hellkite because he does two damage when you play a mountain. Like, it actually, again, it actively hurts them to deal two damage instead of one from these things. Um... We can probably cut the other two landfall deal of damage creatures also. So the big benefit to running them in my deck is that I run fetches, so it's very easy to landfall twice and get two triggers. Um, so even if I keep these in, if you're going to cut the fetches, because most of the fetches are incredibly expensive, like the only fetches you get at reasonable prices are like uh, Terramorphic, Evolving Wilds, there's, like, two other ones that can fetch that, like, they tap for a colorless man, and you can spend two and sacrifice them to fetch a land. Um, maybe, like, Grixis Panorama and the Maestro's one. Um, and then you have access to, like, the terrible um, Mirage ones that come into play tapped. But yeah, if you want to like, if you want to do the landfall deal of damage to opponents uh, effects, then you're going to need to run like those type of fetches if you can't afford um, the better ones. 
And honestly, I kind of like just moving away from that entirely. Despite the fact that I am running the fetches, I don't think we need the when I the landfall deal of damage cards. I don't think they're helping as much. I really like Make Mischief in this version. Uh, Metallurgic Summons. Disallow. <clears throat> walking Ballista. My first instinct, if you don't have the Walking Ballista and you don't have the money for it, is to replace it with Triskillion, uh, which I'm pretty sure is in like the $2 range. Uh, Triskillion is functionally a Walking Ballista that you've spent, you know, where X is 3. Uh, that you can't add counters to. Um, at that point, though, I probably just cut it entirely, and I'm not a hundred percent sure it needs to be in this deck. It's going to stay in for a while anyway. Like it's a good mana sink when we don't have anything else going on uh, to deal a bunch of damage. But maybe Triskillion, maybe one of the um, you know, like the Goblin rocket launchers and whatnot. Uh, like the Mirrodin one or the Antiquities one. Although I think we cut those already, and Rocket Launcher was in Revise, so it shouldn't be too, too expensive, but I think I had cut it already, and so I don't have a price range for it. So maybe it's expensive. But the one from Mirrodin shouldn't be. It's like an uncommon. Uh, I like keeping the Talani Summoner. There's Tetsuko, who's making my team unblockable. A lot of the time. Murmuring Mystic. One damage when we cast an instant or sorcery. Thousand Year Storm gets to stay for right now. Maybe we cut Immolation Shaman. Uh, we can probably cut Light up the stage. Like, if it didn't make it in the Storm version, I don't think it's going to do great in our deck either. Six cards cut now. Healy, Spark Double, Tybalt. Yeah, I'm debating, like, if we even need... The Dream Stalker, the Mischievous Chimera, like they they both reward us for casting spells on other players' turns, which I think we still have enough cards where I would want to cast a bunch of spells in one turn. That casting the first spell on an opponent's turn isn't as appealing. So, suppose we can go ahead and cut both of them. Eight cuts now. But sorcerer can stay. Yeah, we can cut the Legac to go along with the uh, other thing that we cut for the landfall damage sources. So that's nine. Um. Mari Command, Rowan. The equation, Storm Kiln. Missiles, RIL. Burn down the house. Liar. Breather, Lambolt, Maniform, Volatile, Arsonist. Epicure. We can probably still cut the Epicure. The Epicure is so low impact. That'll give us 10 cuts. And go back up here. Go down to 172. And clear all. Alright, only 112 more cards to go. Deals combat damage. Copy the next instant or sorcery spell. We probably don't need this guy, if I'm being honest. Just cut him. 
I don't super need to copy the instants and sorceries that I'm casting. Um, also probably don't need the scepter either. If we're not storming consistently, like the scepter goes down in value, I might still leave it in, but I think we need it a lot less. Um, uh, I do like these cards. Uh, the access denied. It makes a whole lot of thopters, potentially, and having a bunch of one-power flyers is definitely something I'm interested in. It's five mana is the problem. Like, trying to hold up five mana... It's usually not going to work out too well. Can probably cut the deflecting SWAT. I don't think we need... I love Fierce Guardianship. Like, if I'm in blue, I'm almost definitely running Fierce Guardianship, which was why I was trying to find more of them, so I don't have to proxy them in, like, every deck after the first one I built with blue in it. Like, it's already in my Nin deck, and it's technically in a bunch of my other blue decks, too, just because... Um, yeah, I think we'll keep Varchild for now. We might wind up cutting her, but... Maybe we cut Ingenious Artillerist. We don't have a ton of cards putting artifacts into play. We have some... And some of those ones put, like, one at a time into play as we do things. But for the most part, they put a bunch of artifacts in at once, and he deals that much damage. So, if we put, if one effect puts five artifacts into play simultaneously, we deal five damage instead of five instances of one damage. Which, you know, would become 15. So, it kind of diminishes him, uh, power level wise. If we're not going to consistently put one artifact into play each time. Like, if we were just going to, oh, I make an artifact, oh, I make an artifact, oh, I make an artifact. But we only have, I think, like, two cards that can do that consistently. The Apprentice and the Stormkiln Artist. So, otherwise we're not normally just making one artifact at a time to trigger this guy to deal three damage. Other than by casting an artifact. Like, actually casting an artifact spell. So, uh, we'll leave Dak for now. We might still wind up cutting Dak because we're not. Actually, we probably are cutting Dak. Um, since we're not trying to storm off, uh, the extra card draw is okay. Uh, stealing the opponent's artifact is always good. Like, there are so many mana rocks and powerful artifacts floating around in Commander that. That ability always has a good target, I feel like. Uh, and we cut all of the spells that we had that were cantrips that target. Uh, like, give a creature haste, or this creature can't block this turn, which would be insane with his ultimate. But that's not really what our deck is about, so... Oh, wow. So, I did not think of this before, but Chandra's Incinerator is actually kind of insane with repercussion. So, we deal, um, you know, non-combat damage to an opponent somehow, like we ping them for a damage. The Incinerator triggers and deals that much damage to a creature or planeswalker that player controls. If we deal that much damage to the creature... Um, then Repercussions is going to trigger and deal that much damage to the controller, which will then be non-combat damage dealt to the controller. Yeah, that's going to spiral real quick until all of their creatures are dead or the opponent is. That's hilarious, actually. I didn't even realize we had that combo potential. Alright, so even more so, Repercussions is probably going to stay in. Um... So real quick, while I'm talking about prices and cards, this Chandra is almost definitely going to make it to my final version of the deck. 
I don't have her written down because all I care about is the plus uh, two, I think it is. Um, like, she has other abilities, and they're also good, and they also work in this deck. But this is the Chandra that plus twos, she can't be countered, she plus twos to give each opponent an emblem that deals one damage to them. Which is the most Gearson Sarn ability I think we can get on a magic card. Uh, just the constant, I'm going to keep dealing one damage to you. And if she lives through a turn cycle and they get another one of those, each one of them is individuals. Like, so each one is a source, a, is a, yeah, is dealing one damage is a single source of damage. I'm, like, tripping over the words. So, each one of them while Gearson is in play is a lightning bolt to that opponent. And if this Chandra does not die immediately... And you get, like, you cast her on your turn, you you have priority when the spell resolves, you immediately plus two her, so that way uh, you get that first, um, you get that first emblem on everybody. And then if she lives, you just, I don't think you can lose, except to, like, a sudden, oh my god, like, you were already either super dead, or somebody actually combos off and kills you, because this thing will just chew through opponents so quickly. If you get two of them, if they are taking six damage a turn from her plussing, and they haven't killed her yet, like, ah, it's so good. So yeah, Chandra, Awakened Inferno. Like, for, first and foremost, I think Repercussions is like the expensive card that the deck needs, but my god, this Chandra in this deck. It's probably just one of the strongest plays we have. Um, yeah, I cut the other copy of spell thing. I don't think we need the goggles either. We're probably going to wind up cutting the Aether Grid. We do make a fair number of artifacts. Like, gear per Aether Grid is not terrible, but it's not the primary focus of our deck. Um... Also, I think we can cut Fire of Kaladesh. Like, if we're cutting the um, the Cinder that tapped to deal a damage and untapped when we cast a red spell, uh, I don't think we need this Chandra. Also, the flip version just isn't that good in our deck. So, she's actually better if we could choose not to flip her, but that's not an option. We can't, like, alter the timeline and have Chandra not become a Planeswalker, which is a shame because I would much prefer... Uh, that version of her in this deck. Uh, Firebrand stays in for right now. Because that one does deal a single point of damage and also can copy our spells and can do other things, because why shouldn't she? Uh, leave an Arcane Bombardment for now, because I feel like... I feel like we have more time to Arcane Bombardment in this version of the deck. Uh, when we're trying to storm off, we we are only going to get, like, one or two spells on the Arcane Bombardment. But if we get, like, one or two spells on it in this version, we probably do enough damage um, to merit the 6-drop enchantment that we played. We might still wind up cutting it but I think it does more... When we're not trying to storm off in a single turn, I think it does more. Um, also, you do cast the copies of the spell, which I believe matters for storm. Like, normally, you like it says you copy the spell, um, but it doesn't actually cast the copy. It just puts a copy of the spell on the stack already... You know, similarly to how you can put a creature into play tapped and attacking and it doesn't count as a creature that you attacked with. Um, copying the spells a lot of the time just puts the copy directly on the stack and you never cast anything. Uh, Arcane Bombardment actually does cast the copies. Like, you create copies of each of the spells and then you cast them in whatever order that you want to. So I believe they count as spells having been cast for Storm.
I could be wrong about that one. I'm almost positive because of the the wording is different. Like like I said, most spells when it says you copy them, you just copy the spell that's already on the stack. Uh, because there is not a spell already on the stack, you have to create the copy and then cast it with Arcane Bombardment. Um, like, for example, Jin up here, he does, uh, the, you cast the spell already, so when he creates a copy of it, he's just creating a copy of that spell already on the stack and adding it to the stack, and then the copy resolves, but you're not casting anything from Jin, you just cast the original spell. Arcane Bombardment, since you didn't have the original spell already on the stack for it to copy, uh, Arcane Bombardment has to create a copy of the spell and let you cast it in order to get it onto the stack. Speaking of Jin, though, I don't think we need him. Like, he's good. He's just generically good, though. And we're not getting anything really out of copying spells other than the effect of the spell again, which is always nice, but it's not essential to this deck. Like, we already cut a bunch of other copy effects, and Jin is just adding uh, expense to the deck without necessarily being anything the deck super needs, so... I suppose we li we leave Zarael for right now. I want to keep Magic Missile. Storm Kiln Artist. Solve the equation. <sighs> Do we need Rowan? Like, she's certainly fine with the deck, but I don't think we need the cost reduction effects anymore since we're not necessarily storming um so that goes down in value uh so then she plus ones to deal one damage to each of our opponents um and her ultimate is a minus four she starts on two so we need to activate her twice uh we get an emblem that lets us pay two to copy our spells when we cast them which again does not add to storm count when we need that, and also is not doing a ton for us. Like, copying the spells is fine, obviously. You get, like, an extra copy of the effect of that spell. So it's not like that is a useless effect somehow in our deck. Like, that's never going to be true. <laughs> but at the same time, a lot of our things, we don't need to copy them to get them to do what we wanted to do in the first place. Um, if that makes any sense, like, it's not like we need to keep copying the spells in order to stack enough of them to actually get where we're going. Most of the time, casting the spell is going to trigger what we need it to anyway, so putting in spells that uh, copy the other spells isn't as important. Like, we're probably going to run a couple of them, but we want to run the ones that are doing other stuff too, and I don't think we care enough about Rowan, uh, Rowan's other stuff. Like, I would rather have uh, Rao Zarek, uh, Storm Conduit, or uh, Chandra Firebrand at that point for their other effects. Roiling Vortex. Roiling Vortex is still kind of hit or miss. Like, it can stop players from gaining life, which, you know, is always helpful if you run into that. But it is going to deal one damage to us on our turn, as well as one damage to each other player. It's a, It has a copper tablet, you know, barbed wire type of effect, where it's dealing one to everybody all the time. And it's stopping players from gaining life. So... But those are its two primary modes. I don't think it does anything else. Here, real quick, just to just a triple check. Roiling Vortex. Right, it has the can't gain life and the uh, one damage each turn. 
Oh, right, that's the other thing. If a spell was cast and no mana was spent to cast it, it deals 5 damage. It it had other text, but I almost feel like that's trinket text a lot of the time. Also, that's actually... So, the one place that's going to hurt us is if we actually have Arcane Bombardment going. Each of those is a spell being cast without mana being spent on it. So... Yeah, maybe... Maybe not Roiling Vortex. Like, it's already a little dangerous for us, but not, you know, a ton. I did like it for the no life gain portion, but if we're going to bother with Arcane Bombardment, I feel like we can't run both. Like, either Roiling Vortex or Arcane Bombardment has to go, because they are terrible together. Because each one of them is an individual spell. So if we cast a spell, and then we exile a card at random and copy it, we take 5 damage. The next time we trigger Arcane Bombardment, we take 10. And then 15. And that's just untenuable. Like, even if we knew exactly which spells we were getting, that, that seems completely untenuable. So... And I kind of want the Arcane Bombardment, I feel like. like, And even if it gets cut, I don't know that we're going to like immediately go, okay, well now that's cut, we're grabbing Roiling Vortex. So, yeah, I think we're safe to cut that one. That's another 10, so that brings us down to 162. So, 102 cards left. That we need to cut out of this thing. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, Mana Drain can probably be, like, I want it to be, like, a two-mana counterspell if you're going to replace Mana Drain, which doesn't give you a ton of options, um, and a hard counter, too, like, we don't want to replace Mana Drain with, like, Mana Leak or something where the opponent can pay three or four any amount of mana and not get their spell countered. But the problem is, is that a lot of early counter spells don't cost... Like, they cost 3 mana for the other ones. Like, I would almost say Arcane Denial, as bad as that one is. Uh, Arcane Denial is from uh, Alliances. It's blue and one. You counter the spell, and then on the next turn's upkeep, you draw a card, and the person whose spell got countered gets to draw two cards. Um, again, it's not amazing... But in a multiplayer game, giving the depending on the player too, like as long as you're countering the most important card, uh, it's very hard for players to draw uh, cards that like you don't want to use it to counter something that's mildly obnoxious. You want to use it to counter something that's game ending at that point. Whereas mana drain, you can use it to counter something obnoxious because you're going to get the mana. Uh, you know. Like, if Karn Liberated is not going to wreck your board or anything, but he's a 7-drop and you can steal 7 mana for your next turn, like, that's a thing where you can mana drain him, where you might not want to Arcane Denial him type of deal. Like, but at the same time, we're running counter spells also to stop opponents from doing something that wins them the game or stops us from winning the game. So, if we need... Uh, cards like that, you know, to stop them from doing, stop them from winning the game, or stop them from stopping us from winning the game, then we need hard counters that are cheap. Um, that's true. I didn't check, uh, what, uh, what's its name is up to, uh, Pact of Negation, because Force of Will is like 80 plus dollars. Like, I found a handful of them in like the high 70 range, but... For the most part, it's like 80 to $85 for Force of Will, so... We're going to need to replace that for budget considerations, and Misdirection is not as good. Misdirection is fine for countering uh, counters, uh, so you can never have a spell target itself, but what you can do is misdirect the spell to Misdirection. Um... As long as Misdirection itself is still a valid target for the counter spell, like, you know, they didn't play a spell that counters a sorcery or a creature spell, like, you can't misdirect that to Misdirection, but if they just played, like, Counter Spell or Mana Drain or Force of Will or something, you can uh, redirect that to the Misdirection itself, uh, and then Misdirection will resolve and no longer be on the stack, 
but the change will have been legal at the time, so the spell will also fail, so, like, Mana Drain won't actually give them any mana if you misdirect it to misdirection. Um, like, changing the target that way doesn't actually give them the mana, it doesn't give them a five mana for misdirection. So, that's a thing. I believe misdirection was only, like, four or five dollars, something like that. Yeah, misdirection because of its uh, master set reprints. Um, there are a bunch of like four dollar ones floating around. So, so yeah, you can use that. To replace like force of will. But yeah, for mana drain. I really want it to be, like, another, like, two-mana counterspell, and unfortunately, most of the, um, hard counter two-mana spells, uh, have either, like, hoops to jump through or drawbacks. Um, like, I don't think we have enough creatures, let alone creatures with good comes-into-play abilities for, like, Familiar's Ruse, uh, to be in the deck. So... And we can't count on it being, like, the second spell being cast or something for, you know, cards like Urtai Scorn. Or uh, the opponent having cast enough spells for Mind Break Trap, necessarily. So... So, yeah, I think as far as cutting cards go... Like, trying to, trying to do, um, uh, like, budget considerations now... Because these cards are likely to make it into my version of the deck, so I need to start coming up with budget versions that can, you know, like things that can replace them, and I'd like to replace their actual utility, not just run a different card entirely, like, oh, well, guess we just don't have a lot of counter spells in the deck, guess we're running, you know, like these cards instead, and trying to, like, that might be correct to try and focus on our own strategy, but... That was already a thing that had me kind of down on the Storm deck. But at least the Storm deck is winning in one turn. Whereas this uh, particular pile is not about doing that. So, Alright, so thinking about it, I'm looking at Lightning Cloud. So Lightning Cloud only works whenever anybody casts a red spell. As opposed to the Ley Line of Lightning, where whenever we cast any spell, we can pay one. Uh, this one is whenever a red spell is cast, we can pay red and deal a damage. And I think that's weak enough at four mana. We might cut the Ley Line, too. I'm starting to think that I want this deck to run, like, the creature's... All those ones that we cut where if we cast a spell we get a creature, and all of the enchantments that punish the opponent for getting into combat with us in some way, um, I'm leaning towards those for the deck uh, as our source of damage, and then having like a bunch of one power creatures running around. So, I kind of want to cut the things that aren't helping that. Yeah, maybe we do cut, like, the curiosity and stuff. The problem is, is that's still really good. Like, we have two different Niv-Mizzets that those cards work really well with, and both of them probably want to stay in the deck anyway, so I keep, like, almost cutting curiosity and going, but the Niv-Mizzets... <sighs> we'll wait till we're getting closer, until we need, like, ten cuts, and then we have to cut some things, and it'll be like, yeah, those actually have to go. Um, Aether Sting I'm alright with for right now. Caltrops I like. I really like Caltrops. I like so many things with repercussions, but I love Caltrops. The idea that they're going to attack with, like, all of their creatures, and those creatures are going to each take a damage, and then Gearson's going to shoot all of those creatures, and repercussions is just going to, like, annihilate our opponent. <clears throat> yeah, maybe Barbed Wire's just too cute, like, the one damage a turn, and we have to spend mana to not take the one damage ourselves. That might be one of those, that's a cute trick, but we have better stuff we can be doing.
All right, so I kind of want to cut Jessica, but I want to leave her as a alternative to a card like uh, Goblin Sharpshooter. Like, we need um, cards. Like, I want the Sharpshooter in the deck. I think the Sharpshooter is really good for this type of build. But at the same time, it's a $15 card. So if I need a budget consideration, we need to replace uh, Sharpshooter with something. And there's no card that's even close to doing what Sharpshooter is doing. Like, uh, there's nothing else that's uh, where the trigger is untapping it and it taps to deal a damage. Um, like, there's nobody else with uh, Sharpshooter's game text at all. Like, not even deal a point of damage to your opponent and untaps when a creature dies. At least not in red. There might be a black one that does that, but there's not one in red that does that, so... I'll keep Solar Blast. Fabricate can stay for right now. We'll see if I want to get rid of other artifacts. Skull Clamp. If we're making all these 1-1s, one -ones, I really want to keep Skull Clamp in the deck. Um, we can probably... We can probably cut the Cannon and the Reckless Ember Mage, but those also fall into the category of cards I want to keep off to the side because they're cheap. Um, and can replace, like, reusable damage sources that we have in the... that we're going to lose from the deck. We can probably cut the Honden. Yeah, I think I'm inclined to keep, uh, cards that... uh, deal damage, like... I'm thinking about cutting a lot of the ones that just deal A damage per turn. Like, so the Honden's gone, Jessica's gone, um, I'm getting rid of cards like that, uh, Barbed Wire is gone, where we can't do anything to increase, uh, the amount of damage that these cards are doing. They can only deal one per turn, or one per turn cycle type of things. Like, I'm starting to think that might be... So let's look for more of those. Glenelendra, Hissing Iguanar... Fireheart... Ray Bombardment, Spawning Breath, Spike Shot... Yeah, like, Curse of the Pierced Heart can go... Uh, Hellrider, Cyclonic Rift, Electricery, Fire Dancer, Prophetic Flame Speaker, Goblin Slide, Outpost Siege, Impact Tremor, Flame Blade Angel. Yeah, we can probably cut the Gibbering Fiend. Same principle applies. That's seven now. Allow, Implement of Combustion, Walking Ballista, Blazing Volley, Soul Scar, Firebrand, Chain Whirler, Tetsuko, Avocade, Ibolation Shaman, Rao, Sahili, Tybalt. Rock Slide Sorcerer. Orloff. Eritus. Have any other cards that are only functionally one damage per turn cycle? Well, Mana Form. Arsonist kind of is. Like, it deals the one damage to each of up to three different targets, but it, they all have to be, like, different types, too. Like, it's the player, a creature, and a planeswalker. So, yeah, I think we can cut Volatile Arsonist. Uh, bombardment, Roastmaster, Recruiter, Inferno Titan... Just Waken Inferno.
Yeah, it is kind of weird. I'm cutting like all of these ones that can only deal one damage per turn cycle after singing the Chandra. But the Chandra starts at that, and if she doesn't die, you just keep doing that, but more so. Like, she becomes more copies of that every turn that she lives and has other utility. So I think we're. I think she uh, dodges being in the same category as the things that we're cutting for those reasons. Diminish, just denied, smoke spirits aid, replication, flamer, pink car, scepter, prankster. All right, so want to go down here. and keep track of cards that I think could go back in the deck to make up for cards that we're currently taking out. So Jessica, uh, the cannon, um, don't think we need Honden, don't think we need, oh, excuse me, Curse, um, Probably don't need the arsonist either. All right, so we got one uh, Fiend is two, Curse is three, Honden's four, Cannon's five, Jessica six, Barbed Wire seven, Lightning Clouds eight, and then I want to get rid of um, the Reckless Ember Mage from Mirage or Mirage Block. This is nine. Although I'm willing to put him down also for like potential replacement budget options. So that's nine. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so that's nine cards cut. So 153. Let me clear all. Do a quick save. Yeah, let's pop back over to Gearson. Don't need to look at Roiling. Or, yeah, Roiling Vortex. Yeah, we cut Anger, but Anger, I don't think I have enough ways to discard anymore to get him into the graveyard, and we only have, like, one or two ways to sacrifice him also, so probably okay with that. Like, I'm looking at Fervor, and, you know, Fervor we have to spend three mana on, and it's an enchantment, whereas Anger can just be in the graveyard and have no mana spent on him as long as we control a mountain, our guys have haste. Uh, I don't think I want mass hysteria. Giving everybody else's stuff haste when our things are relatively tiny, probably not the best idea. I don't know if we're going to want cards like Memory Jar. We might, though. Uh, if we wind up putting... Yeah, if we wind up keeping, like, Memory Jar and whatnot, and... I need budget considerations. There's always like Magus of the Wheel and uh, Reforge the Soul. That would both be fine as ways to like get rid of our hand and draw seven new cards. <sighs> Repercussions, yes. Close quarter combat, probably. Mystic study, like, that can definitely go for budget considerations. I just don't know if I want it for the deck or not. I have to lose some number of these fun one damage effects, I feel like, because we need, you know, close to 100 cuts still, so I think it was close to 100. I thought we were at, like, 150-something, but maybe I'm forgetting... If we cut Kumano, I think Kumano is actually not the worst replacement for uh, Walking Ballista. 
Uh, he starts off as a 4-4, four, four, and you can spend two mana to have him deal one damage. And things that he kills are exiled, so there's even some uh, utility value in that. Uh, making sure that certain things don't get reanimated later on. <clears throat> yeah, I'm wondering if we need the clone effects. Uh, the clones are fun for Gearson, like uh, the two different Sakashimas and the Irenicus's duplication and Spark Double all work because they become non-legendary copies of him or have different names than him or ignore the legend rule for the Sakashimas specifically. But yeah, like Vile Duplication and Spark Double are non-legendary copies of the card and the two Sakashimas just circumvent the legend rule in their own ways. Um... But that adds a ton of damage when we have, like, one of those copying him, so... I kind of want to keep them. Same reason I kind of want to keep Overblaze. Flame Fusillade can probably go. Minge Electrode... Yeah, we can probably get rid of Ley Line of Lightning, too. Grape Shot, Ophidian Eye, Think Twice, Coalition Relic, Needle Drop, Research the Deep, Blight Sickle, Flame Jab, Archmage, Hissing Iguanar. So, Fire Heart. Restless Collar, Ray Bombardment. You really like Spawning Breath. Spike Shot Elder is fine. The Taxing Probe, like Gut Shot right now. But again, we're probably going to wind up having to cut a bunch of cards like that. Uh, Passing Flames is still okay. Cyclonic Rift. I was actually surprised at Cyclonic Rift. I thought this one had gotten reprinted enough that its price tag wouldn't be quite so high, but... Apparently not. Double Slide, Outpost Siege... Pack Tremors. Maybe it's Dance with the Devils. It's four mana for two of them. And I think I kind of like the other cards that are making them, like Burn Down the House and Make Mischief, I feel like, are doing better than four mana make two of those guys. Lightning, Metallurgic Summons, Disallow... We might wind up cutting the Implement of Combustion. I like it. Like, it's, you know, two mana, it deals the damage, it lets us draw a card. Red Archer, Goblin Chain Whirler, Tetsuko staying in for right now, because, you know, unblockable one power creatures. Maybe the Immolation Shaman, because we have less control over when it's doing its thing. It is very annoying for opponents, though. Like, if they forget that he's in play and we trigger him and then they take uh, Gearson's damage, you know, it's just like, I'm going to spin the top. Okay, take three. Like, oh, right, that sort of thing. Uh, it does work on fetch lands being cracked. Um, what else? You know, things like putting counters on a walking ballista. Like, it does a lot of stuff. 
Uh, there are a lot of things that frequently show up that can trigger this guy. I don't know that's worth a card in our deck right now. Like, it depends on the deck, too. Like, some decks, it's like, oh, all of my stuff are triggered abilities. Um, like, I have activated abilities, but, you know, and it doesn't work on mana abilities, of course, because it affects land, so we can't have people um, getting uh, hit by mana barbs effects. Yeah, I guess we're safe to cut him. I don't think we need him necessarily, and I want to make some more cuts, like get this thing closer to what it's going to look like, so that way I can start figuring out like which subsets of cards. Like, do we need uh, Torolf? Right now, I really like him in this version of the deck. Um, so when a creature or Planeswalker is dealt excess damage, it deals... Uh, the excess damage to another target. So, if we get something within range and Gearson shoots it for two, and we overkill it by one because of that, then we get to deal one to something else, and then Gearson shoots it for two. Like, we can mow down, um, like, two toughness creatures that way very easily. I don't know that that's necessarily, like, the biggest deal, but, like, every time that you overkill something, like, every time it gets within one point of its toughness and Gearson shoots it for two, uh, Torolf is going to let us shoot uh, another target for one damage, which will be three damage, and I really like that idea. I don't know if it's going to come up as often as I think it is. This is one of those cards where, if it makes it into the main deck... Uh, I would have to play with it enough to see if it's actually as good as I thought it was going to be when I put it in the deck. Like that, That's one of those cards where I it sounds really good and it looks like it should be doing the thing, but maybe it won't. That's true, we probably don't need the Prismari command in this version, like, that is very much a storm card, because it makes the treasure and lets us loot. It's five cuts now. Yeah, like, Prismari command is almost exclusively for the storm build, uh, to keep the storm chain going. Yeah, let us keep digging through more cards for more card draw, and um, adding treasure. And then potentially making enough mana that it actually pays for itself with our other cards. The Witty Roastmaster, Cruder, Inferno Titan, Chandra, Staff of Nin, Pyromancer. Ooh. Ow. I just started stinging. Let's see if I can. There we go. Kind of, like, I like Varchild, like, the idea of her, like, oh, I'm going to keep attacking people and giving them a whole bunch of 1-1s, and then if anything happens to her, like, I get an army of 1-1s to work with. So the one thing we do have to be very careful of, and we're not running it, so, um, I don't know, may maybe, but... So, with repercussions, which I really am very entertained at the thought of running, 
We do have to watch out for Blasphemous Act, especially, and Star of Extinction to a lesser extent, uh, because those will absolutely obliterate us and everybody else at the table. Um, in turn order, too, so wh whoever is, unless, you know, my repercussions goes away, I think that exiles the triggers off of the stack, uh, once I die, because I control the repercussions triggers, I believe. But, yeah, so if somebody casts, like, Blasphemous Act, and everybody's going to take an absolute giant pile of damage because of repercussions to the point where everybody's going to die. Uh, so, it goes active player... So, the non-active player uh, that goes right before the player whose turn it is uh, will be the first to die, and the person that casts them, I believe, is going to be the last to die because of that. Because it's going to go in turn sequence. You, like, the active player puts all the repercussion triggers they have on the stack. Maybe we want Blasphemous Act at that point if we're going to lean that hard on uh, repercussions. Um, but yeah, so, like, I, I cast Blasphemous Act. Uh, then the person that would go next in turn order puts, like, all of their repercussion triggers on the stack, then the person, you know, next in turn order, until we get to the person right before me, and then we start resolving backwards to me again, so that player takes all of their repercussion damage, and so on, until all the triggers are resolved, because repercussions is a triggered effect, it's not like, uh, it's not like, um... Like, the way lifelink works, where it doesn't use the stack and everybody just gains a life before they would die, you know, during combat, it has to actually resolve, and so we would kill everybody in reverse turn order until it got back to the person who actually cast Blasphemous Act, assuming that it kills everybody, you know, assuming that there's not somebody who's just like, oh, I only have one creature in play, I take 13 and, you know, drop down to, like, 18 life now. Or something like that. <sighs> but yeah, do do we actually want Varchild? Like, I love that she makes one ones because those interact very well with our other cards. And it's very easy for us to kill Varchild if we want to, since she's a three three, like Anything we have that deals a point of damage while Gearson is out will just slay her instantly and give us all of the tokens. So. Excuse me. Mm, one, two, three, four, five. So we did five more cuts here. That's going to bring us down to 148. All right. It's not quite late enough where I only have time to do the stuff I need to for work, but it's getting close to that time, and I'm feeling just a tiny bit stuck. Like, we got rid of all of these cards, and that's fine. We're gonna save here, but I'm feeling like I'm slowing down a bit with, like, processing everything and trying to get rid of the cards anyway, so I'm just gonna give myself a little bit of extra mental energy to dedicate to work, and we're gonna call it here for right now. So hopefully I'll be back on tomorrow and Wednesday for like an hour or two, same as today. Um, and then Thursday will be my day off, and I'm hoping to have Gearson done somewhere between now and the end of that stream. Uh, that puts us, like, a couple weeks out from the Brothers War. Um, we might have some more spoilers by then. 
I might consider trying to build, like, the Urza or Mishra deck, you know, since they're both out and we have them spoiled. I heard rumors that they're doing, um... Kind of like what they did with Chandra in the one set where the Awakened Inferno comes from, where there's, like, a mythic rare version, a rare version, and an uncommon version, and they're, like, all different cards. Uh, so that way there's, like, three different Urzas and three different Mishras in the set, with, like, the mythic top ends being, like, them at the end of the story, basically, where Urza becomes a Planeswalker and Mishra is, like, this super Phyrexian monstrosity. Um... Like, we've already seen those two, but, and in addition to the, uh, commander decks, there's going to be, like, an Urza and a Mishra at rare, and then an Urza and a Mishra at uncommon in the set, and they're going to be, obviously, like, different power levels than the Mythics that fuse together, or even the plain, like, not Planeswalker decks, the commander decks that they're going to be in charge of. But there are going to be, like, three different versions of each of them, so there might be, like, a different fun build around Urza or Mishra that we might see at that point. And we're also getting a bunch of the other Legends, uh, including characters that have never had a card. Honestly, I kind of want to wait until we have the spoiler to start working on it, because if Gix is anything cool, I'm going to build him. Like, unless he's, like, another uh, Braids type, uh, would be really good at the head of a um, mono-black stack deck type of deal, because then I already have the deck built, and I might just, like, if I'm going to do that, and I really like um, Gix, I might do that. Like, I might just put him as the head of the deck instead, because Braids, while she does function with the deck, uh is not the most important card in her own deck. Like, she is adding to the strategy. But, like, even, um... Oh god, I've, lost, I've forgotten her name. Tegrid would probably make a better commander overall for that deck, despite the deck not being tuned towards Tegrid. And either of them would be easily replaced if Braids came off the ban list, like OG Braids came off the ban list. For commander, because the deck would absolutely, like, trip over itself to put her in charge. So, if Gix is, like, a really good stacks commander, and he's mono-black, um, I might be tempted at that point to just do that with him. But if he's a really cool card that isn't specifically a stacks commander build, then I might want to build a deck around him, because Gix is one of those cards, like, I liked the villain at first, like when I was first reading the uh, Brothers War story and, you know, getting to know the character. And then I was super sad that he never got a card. And every time they do uh, one of those things where it's like, okay, and we're going to have, like, legendary creatures from old magic sets and we're going to give a bunch of them that never had cards their own card, I keep hoping for Gix. So, I am really excited to see what he does. Obviously, he could be terrible, or he could be something that I was not expecting, and I'm not, like, thrilled by him because of that. But I really want him to be a good card. Like, Gix is one of those characters. Like, I love the what they did with Zonstra when she finally got a card. I really wanted her to get a card also, and I like what she does, but I've never had a good deck for her. Like, I put her in Mogus, and immediately, like, the first time I cast her, I was like, oh, I have made a grievous mistake, because I, Mogus is your sock outlet to get rid of her. So, it's like, I'm going to deal two damage to you unless you sacrifice a creature. It's like, well, you did just give me Zanstra, so I'm going to sack Zanstra. It's like, right, wow. Wow, does that not work the way I wanted it to. So... Yeah, I've never had a deck for her yet, um, but I at least like her design. So even though I've never used her in anything really, I do like the way she's designed as like this super version of the sleeper agent card that was like a stand-in for her. Like they made a card called sleeper agent that you gave to your opponent dealt damage to them. Um, but then they realized that the storyline-wise, she was going to be a major character, 
and she was a sleeper agent, so they put her on the art for the card without, you know, making it legendary or anything. So, uh, so she had her own, so she had representation as a card, but not as, like, a legendary card for her, and then they went and, like, did a much better version of a black-red sleeper agent card and made it legendary, and, you know, so that way Zanstra would have a card. So I really want Gix to get that treatment. Like, I want his card to be really cool, uh, even if I don't wind up using him for anything. I just want his card to be, like, really good and cool, because I like Gix, and I always wanted him to have a card. Um, I used uh, Claws of Gix a lot when it first came out, um, in Extended, actually, as a way to gain life. I used Necropotence and Pox and Yawgmoth's Will together, and Claws of Gix, whenever relevant, uh, to eat things to gain life where I wasn't going to just lose that much life anyway. Like, you know, if I'm going to lose a land, if I'm going to lose, like, three lands or four lands because I have one too many, then I might as well eat some of the lands if I'm only going to, you know, if it's not going to change the amount of life that I lose. I might as well eat the lands to Claws of Gate, like, that sort of ways to gain life. Uh, just to give myself an extra point or two uh, that the pox wasn't going to take away immediately, and I was going to lose those cards anyway. Like, so yeah, I have a lot of fondness for Gix, um, and I really want his card to be absurdly good. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'm hoping he has a good card. But if we aren't close enough to uh, the previews, like if we don't get enough previews early on where I'm just like, I guess I can kind of start working on this card because we're really close to the Brothers War. It's like two weeks away or something um, from the pre-release. So I kind of want to be working on a Brothers War commander by then. Uh, but assuming that we have time, maybe maybe I'll go back and build one of the absolutely bonkers, um, you know, Acorn commanders from Unfinity, because I didn't actually do an Unfinity Commander. Like, maybe we'll build the Mono White one that uh, everything on her is functionally on everything else also uh, type of deal. Uh, just because I think we could do that quickly, like in a couple weeks. Um, like, either her... I like the Parade Leader more as a potential Commander, but I would actually have to take a lot of time to pick out the cards for her, uh, that are interacting with her very well, because she, she has this whole thing where, uh, end of turn effects don't end, but instead they gain cumulative upkeep one life or something, like, while she's tapped, she keeps getting counters, and the counters keep making you pay more life each turn, and then once she finally untaps, uh, the effect ends, or she leaves play, the effect ends also, but once she finally untaps and the effect ends, she loses all of those counters, so the next time you want to turn an effect, but we would need to, like, figure out life gain and counter removal and what effects we want to extend, and that would probably take, like, you know, I want to say, like, three weeks to a month and a week or something to build her deck at the rate we've been going, so... So I don't want to start in on something and then the Brothers War cards are out and I kind of really want to build one of the Brothers War commanders as like a more serious commander. But I do feel kind of bad that, you know, Unfinity gave us all of these potential commanders, both actual and, you know, absurd, and I didn't do anything with them. Like, we even cut Mira from this deck because... As interesting as she is, and I think she's, like, the most readily built-around commander from it, um, she's not... Like, there are a lot of other people that wanted to build her immediately, and probably have done so by now. Not that the people aren't building around other things, like... I haven't watched the video, because I want to focus on my thing, and there'll be enough parallel design anyway, uh, because we're both building around the same commander... Uh, but Commander's Quarters uh, did do a Gears and Starn build. Um, and I am sure that we looked at a lot of the same cards, even if they don't wind up using a lot of the cards that I'm using. 
Also, I have the potential to use a bunch of cards that they're not because it's Commander's Quarters specifically, and they tend to do very budget builds of Commander, so... With, like, only the Commander and, like, maybe one other card being in there. It'd be really funny if their card is Repercussions also. Like, their one... I think he usually has, like, one omission where he can, like, spend some money on the deck for, like, one specific card that really makes the deck. I don't know if that's true or not, or if there's just, like, one card that's, like, a key card, and that's what he's talking about. It's been a while since i watched one of his videos. I watched, like, two or three of them because I was bored at work at the time, and, you know, I think he had, like, a... one of the ones where he was trying to build, like, actual no land in the deck. Um... But it was using, like, all of the modal double-faced uh, land creatures f or land spells from Zendikar to get around that. So that way, the front face of all of the cards were spells for uh, certain effects, uh, caring about, you know, basically similar to, like, a Charbelcher deck where nothing in it is actually a land when it flips up. Um, it might have even been a Charbelcher deck, now that I think about it. But anyway, um, so yeah, I've watched a couple of his videos, so, but I did, because I've watched them, it does recommend to me new stuff that he does, and I did see that he built a Gears and Starn deck, um, but again, I didn't watch it because I don't want to have that influence me at all for my deck building process, like, if they look similar at the end... Uh, that's going to just be because of parallel design, because that's a thing that happens. If you start with the same, like, go from the same starting point with the same end goal, uh, it's very easy to wind up getting there the same way a lot of the time. Um, so we're both starting with Gears and Sarn, and we're both looking for ways to uh, utilize his effect. So... Yo, know, anybody who wants to build a Gears and Starn deck, the first thing they're going to do is look at things that deal a single point of damage. Like, because that's his whole deal. Um, so creatures with one power and spells that deal a single point of damage and activate abilities that deal a single point of damage. Like, that's going to be the focal point of a Gears and Starn build in some way or other. Um, so... It's just a matter of, do we get there, like, how close the decks look similar. Like, I, I am almost positive that we are we have to have some amount of overlap, especially in the cheaper cards. And it depends on what he tries to do with his version of the deck. Uh, which, like, how much will it look like mine? And vice versa. So, again, I don't want to... I'm kind of curious, like, I might go watch it when the deck is done just to see how close we were, but I don't want to watch it until after I'm done with it, because I'm really, I want to do it my way, and, you know, and then if we disagree, then on certain cards, you know, like, if he gets to a card, he's like, and yeah, I decided not to bother with this one, or uh, these things I think are important, and then it's like, when we get back to me, it's like, I'm cutting those things. Um, I'm going to be okay with that, but... <clears throat> I'm at, I am curious, like, you know, get another opinion on how to build Gearson type of deal, so. Then again, I didn't go back and watch his Miracle build. Um, like, I, I was considering either Miracle or the Candlekeep Worm, and they had already done, like, you know, I had seen a bunch of uh, videos, suggestions for the Worm. Uh, the one that, she's the blue, red, green one that copies dragon spells when you cast them. Um, like a bunch of people were building around her. It's like, okay, well, I like her and I like Miracle, and I kind of want to build Miracle more anyway, so I'll build Miracle. But after I had started Miracle, um, I got recommended the Commander's Quarters Miracle build, and I'm just like, so, but I never actually went back and watched that one, so. <clears throat> after we were done, I just kind of went into the next deck after that. But yeah, I'm kind of curious to see like what Commander's Quarters build for Starn looks like, but I don't want to do it until after I'm done building Gearson myself and just let my deck be my own deck 
And if they happen to overlap, like I said, it's going to be parallel design. It's going to be, we start at the same point, and we're trying to get to the same end point. So, which tools and which uh, builds did we think got us there? Like, there's going to be some number of cards, I have to believe, especially with me having two different builds of the deck, that are going to be the same from one to the other. Um, but that's it. So, yeah. After saying I was going to quit uh, like 15 minutes ago, I went on a nice long rant. So that's going to do it for me today. So thanks for watching. Uh, we'll try and finish Gearson sometime this week. Hopefully before Thursday, but probably on Thursday. And then we'll figure out what I'm going to build next. Um, so hope you're looking forward to that. And I will see you next time. Have a good rest of your day.